I, I think we all come each day thinking what happened in the world of politics yesterday, last night, this morning, last week, um, that the amazing changes that influence all of us that are occurring both at the federal politics level and also at the state level make it pretty interesting uh, for us and we all have our own opinions about what should be and what shouldn't be. I think we're very privileged today to have uh, Vicky Chapman, who's the Deputy Leader of the State Liberal Party, and we also have Rachel Sanderson here, the Member for Adelaide, which is our club's area. Um, but my introduction to Vicky is that I've known Vicky for some years, not as many as she and I would like to admit, uh, and I've worked with her on various things. Uh, but she's a, she, she has brought to politics qualities that she honed in her skills as a lawyer. And uh, as we're all aware, it's pretty tough times. And uh, Vicky's going to talk initially about marine parks. However, I would imagine that if uh, she uh, finishes in a reasonable amount of time, because I'm not sure how, you know, marine parks is a topic that was, I think Giuliano decided it was a topic that should be discussed because probably he enjoys fishing. Uh, but the marine parks is quite a serious topic, so look, I'm not decrying that, but I have asked Vicky if she would spend a little bit of time answering some of your questions, because I think there'd be some quite pertinent questions to ask about what's happening in state politics, and perhaps you might talk about federal politics, but I think we're very privileged today to have an individual who brings a clarity of thought and a strength and a determination, which is quite admirable. Please welcome Vicky Chapman. Good afternoon, Mr. President Frank, and to members of the committee for the uh, Rotary Club of Adelaide. Um, and I also acknowledge the former president who's sitting at our table. Uh, thank you. And also, of course, today's chair, um, whom I have known for a good number of years. Uh, to all of the members of the uh, club, uh, can I uh, acknowledge you not only for being uh, members of a premier club for Rotary, uh, I have a couple out in the area I represent who, of course, claim to be the most important in Adelaide. But I think it's fair to say that you really know you've come uh, into the world when you get asked by Adelaide Rotary to address them. Uh, there is the, they are a distinguished club. For those of you who are new in the club, uh, can I say that um, the men and women who are members of this club uh, have really been uh, pioneers they have been leaders in business, uh, in industry, in enterprise, in public service, in public office, uh, and it never ceases to amaze me uh, at the level of, um, of contribution uh, that members of this club have made in so many walks of life in this state. So uh, I personally do feel quite honoured to be present with you today, uh, to have the invitation to address you. Um, it's been very important to me. Can I uh, also acknowledge, of course, my parliamentary colleague, Rachel Sanderson. Uh, Rachel's uh, relatively new in the parliament uh, and has certainly been, um, made an impressive contribution already. Some of you won't know this, but in the last few days she has been uh, working assiduously to uh, remove 4,000 chooks from death row uh, who are sitting out uh, at the um, quarantine station. I wasn't asked to talk about chooks today. I don't know a lot about them, to be honest. And when I grew up, we had a system where if your chooks didn't lay, they weren't worth feeding, and if they did lay, they didn't need feeding. So we, uh, I don't know a lot about them, but uh, Rachel's um, uh, certainly alerted uh, us to concerns uh, about quarantine. And I just mention it because for those of you who are interested in the future of South Australia, even something as humble as the chook uh, needs to be replenished in our state. And what you might have read in the paper recently, uh, of which Rachel has brought to the fore, uh, is the, not just the plight of these birds, but quarantining is really important for us, Australia and South Australia's primary industry in particular. Uh, we are free of uh, foot and mouth disease, which is a great accolade to us here in South Australia, so we want our quarantine people to be vigilant. Uh, but the plight of the 4,000 chooks uh, is the claim that they are 
uh, infected with salmonella, which of course at a commercial level could be very detrimental to the economics of the state uh, if it were to get into poultry and other birds in the state. I'm told, actually, just as late as this morning, that the hatching process, for those of you who are interested in chooks, uh, in England, uh, was that the, um, uh, some um, uh, 18 months ago, a, a, a whole lot of eggs that had been tested were put into incubators uh, in a quarantine station in England, and uh, some weeks later they hatched, and then they were growing out, these chicks, and then they had eggs, and it's those eggs that have turned up in our quarantine station here, allegedly free of disease, uh, which have now uh, hatched, and they've found one that has got a suspected salmonella. So uh, it's always this issue, isn't it, in relation to protecting the productivity and commerciality of what we might do in South Australia uh, against the... Um, uh, the uh, submissions of leniency on penalty for the representatives who are currently in the Supreme Court advocating for the 4,000 chooks that they represent. And people pay a lot of money to bring these into the state. So, look, I just mentioned that as a preamble. Uh, Rachel is on the case, I want to tell you. Good on you. And uh, we're, we're following the story. Now, I was asked to speak about uh, marine parks. and. Um, uh, because I come from um, a long line of fishing family, uh, I, um, I, I once described myself in an article in a publication called The Wild Coast, which frankly, you know, I hadn't heard of until about a year ago. But that's actually a magazine uh, of which I was described as a sixth generation fisherwoman, and I have, um, uh, and I have followed this area with interest. Um, I will say it's not because um, uh, I have... Um, a specific portfolios to cover this area in the Parliament, uh, but because of the significance of the impact on the state, that uh, I was more than happy to uh, address this issue and had, um, uh, in, at a more public level, uh, in the 10 years of the incubation of this um, policy directive uh, and direction of current uh, governments, uh, both national and statewide, uh, because I had convened a public meeting at the local Burnside Town Hall. Uh, now, I don't know whether some of you might have gone along there in the 1960s to listen to Bob Francis or some of those rock and roll eras, probably a few of you. I was far too young. But I do... Um, I, I did take... Uh, um, I, I did take on the occasion that I called a public meeting on marine parks very seriously when over 1,500 people turned up. Now, I've been in politics for most of my life, but in the parliament for about 11 years, and I've gone to lots of rallies and protests and things over the year, but never before have I attended a, a public meeting where people were pushing their way in through the windows from the outside, of which 500 people had to stand outside uh, because they couldn't get in the hall. Uh, I was at the Peterborough Hall one night, uh, advocating some country health um, uh, protection, uh, and there they crammed into the hall, and, uh, and it, they had a few on the outside, but in this occasion they were hanging through the windows. And if ever there was an issue that went across the board, uh, it was this issue. Uh, and, uh, and I wanted to expand on why in just a moment, but it certainly brought it home to me uh, that, that you know, I was not alone with the, those that who were coming to my office to say that this was of concern because of the multitude of levels of the community that it was um, covering. So for all of you who fish, uh, and you can put your hand up, any of you fish recreationally? Yes, good. Any of you have commercial licences? Not as many, uh, not a big uh, occupation in Adelaide, I don't have to say, but uh, it, it's, uh, it's out there. Uh, any of you have members of your family who fish? Yep, good. Neighbours, friends who fish? Okay. Well, you're in the group uh, that have, are about 300,000 recreational fishers in South Australia. And even if you don't fish, there's every likelihood uh, that you uh, holiday in country areas along the massive coastline of South Australia who have an interest in the value of your property or the rent that you'll pay uh, during the uh, summer season to visit those uh, destinations. Uh, or alternatively, you'll have uh, involvement in the wholesale or retailing of boating facilities, 
of, of boating equipment, of fishing tackle, of even uh, um, uh, you know worms and all those things they put in Burley, uh, or you're the people who go down there with your grandchildren to Gore and uh, pick up cockles, which now sell for about ten dollars a kilo uh, in at uh, Raptus or Angelicus. So uh, they it, it, it permeates through so many. Um, can I say that? Um, and I had a few notes to prepare here, which I'll just refer to in a moment, but. Uh, ultimately, um, this will be an issue uh, come next year's election uh, because there are so many communities, uh, whether it's real estate, uh, whether it's regional towns, whether it's fish and chip shops, whether it's uh, people who like to fish, especially uh, families who do beach fishing, uh, who have been precluded under a, a proposed ban, or those who actually don't accept that the, um, the remedy for the ill that's been proposed uh, won't actually be effective. So there's, a, there's that huge gamut. Can I start by saying uh, that I was told last year that uh, your father would have loved marine exclusion zones. Mr Osborne sitting over there, he remembers my father, as probably most of you wouldn't, but uh, he had an interesting sort of history with um, fishing. But I responded, I don't think so. And he replied, yes, they would have been the first place he'd go fishing. <laughs> <laughs> what the government have proposed, for most of you won't appreciate, at the state level and at the federal level, uh, is a number of 19 marine parks of areas of sensitive marine and ecological uh, benefit and of which need our attention to protect. Uh, and we agree with that. What they've since done is overlap that with an area of exclusion zones, in addition to the 14 sanctuaries which are already protected in South Australia for the breeding colony areas uh, for uh, fish and uh, marine life in South Australia. So as someone who grew up uh, in a premier fishing location uh, on Kangaroo Island, I've had the privilege of catching incredible array of fish. I've swum in areas where there are leafy sea dragons. I've never actually seen one, I might say. They're very evasive little critters. But we have international tourism who come to see them uh, in South Australia. And for those of you who don't remember, they are our state marine emblem, the leafy sea dragon. Uh, I've had um, the opportunity in speaking on other occasions about uh, fish and uh, marine life uh, out of Galapagos. Uh, in fact, my last address to a Rotary Club was uh, on uh, wildlife in the Galapagos Islands. So I have a personal passion and history for this uh, area, and I think it's something that we all need to carry with us uh, for the purposes of the future of our state. Um, regularly, of course, I go uh, to Kangaroo Island and uh, on the north coast enjoy that with family and friends. While well, I'm uh, over there on the farm, I of course head down to the beach. Um, but I have to always think about what this new program has done for the fishing uh, and particularly uh, the effect on our recreational life by the introduction of the marine exclusion zones. Uh, fishing is a part of our identity as a state and an activity which has been enjoyed for hundreds of years. Uh, I have to say that in my lifetime I fished with um, uh, many people, including uh, cutting bait and fishing and filleting with my father, shearers, lawyers, a premier, a police commissioner. I won't actually tell you the police commissioner story today, I might, I might get sued, but I will say uh, that I won't be telling you who the best of those are out of the fishermen, uh, but I just highlight the diversity of people who take an interest in this area. It's a perfect example of the variety of people uh, who enjoy fishing and also how important it is that we ensure the fishing opportunities for future generations of Australians and, and as I say the many overseas visitors. Not everybody comes to fish, they come to enjoy uh, the marine uh, uh, activities, that might be diving, photographing uh, and obviously we have a very significant international photographic market uh, who come to South Australia to take photographs of our leafy sea dragons alone, let alone other marine life. So it is of major importance, um, and even for those who might you know, walk along the beach uh, and be want to enjoy uh, uh, looking, of course, at uh, bird life or other uh, life. Uh, unfortunately, there's not a lot of penguins left, but we're, we're dealing with uh, uh, the issue of uh, multiple um, 
abundant native species uh, of the seals and the like, uh, there they uh, overlap another concern. But in any event, uh, under the current proposal put forward, uh, fishing will ban in certain areas throughout the state. Uh, the argument for this proposal um, is quite simple. We need to safeguard our marine environmental biodiversity. Uh, we, uh, we need to have this counter as a measure uh, against um, issues including and pressures including climate change, pollution, competition for the marine resources. I always thought it rather fascinating when I was reading these reports about how the uh, marine exclusion zone is going to help us with climate change. I thought Al Gore would be very impressed uh, to know in South Australia uh, that we think global warming can be stopped by putting away a fishing rod, uh, but in any event, uh, it is, these pressures uh, on our marine life are important, even if the remedy that we think has uh, missed, the, missed the pitch. Uh, unfortunately, uh, fishing uh, has been made the scapegoat for other human activities, which uh, I want to present to you today as being much more damaging, much more damaging uh, than uh, uh, to our environment uh, than the ills that are supposedly to cure. And I will say that when this debate started 10 years ago, it, we were told repeatedly, this is nothing about fishing, this is all about biodiversity and marine life. Okay, so we put our heads down, we got working on it. And, um, but let me tell you the biggest single killer of the biodiversity in our state in marine activity. It's the stormwater that runs off my electorate down through the western suburbs of Adelaide and into the Gulf and has killed the seagrass and has denuded the diversity of marine life uh, in uh, St Vincent Gulf. That is the reality of what is the concern. What happened when the marine parks over the last 10 years? Not once has that area in the St Vincent Gulf been under consideration. In fact, the government's proposal has been to totally exclude that area. So I, I raise that because, you know, my heart bleeds for uh, any denuding of our, uh, whether it's marine or coastal or land environment, uh, which is inflicted by humans and of which could have a remedy. Now, I've spoken to SA Water about it plenty of times, about uh, the harvesting of water to try and minimise the damage that is caused by that. And the answer to why hasn't then our attention been addressed to that is money. It's all about money. It costs a lot of money to actually harvest off that stormwater, re-divert it, protect against pollution, uh, protect that environment, and the opportunity to uh, restore that is long term, not in an election cycle. So it's very disappointing to me. Um, the, the damage is there. Um, I, I've obviously listed across from, from the Premier and successive ministers applauding the Department of Fisheries and SARDI, uh, many of you know the South Australian Research and Development Institute for their hard work. Uh, I, I regularly uh, give a com uh, commendation to them. It is important that we congratulate them for their, for their efforts because they have maintained a sustainable fishery in the state which has been very critical. So uh, it, that's why one of my uh, biggest concerns with the whole marine parks process is why the Environment Department is managing the planning of marine parks and these issues rather than getting onto the issue of getting out pests and worms and things out of the ocean. Pests, I don't mean politicians and public servants, I mean real pests that are out there. Uh, and actually dealing with the uh, seagrass uh, degradation which has been out there and of which is continuing to be uh, damaging. So it's rather bizarre to me that when it comes down to this question of exclusion zones for the purposes of fishing an activity, uh, such as that, uh, that uh, the Department of Environment should have the control of it. You can still go in there with your boat, speed around, for those of you who love boating activity, good luck to you, and I think that's, you know, good, I, I hope you enjoy it. But you can take photographs, you can dive in the water, you can wee in the water, you can do all sorts of things, you just can't fish. So uh, the, the hypocrisy, uh, the, the narrowness, the shallowness, the inadequateness of this type of approach, you know, I, I see this you know, come up in parliaments and when governments have good ideas, you want to support them. When you see this sort of nonsense, uh, it, it's very concerning, especially, especially when there's such a pressing concern to be able to deal with uh, these other environmental uh, aspects. And when it comes to support to building... Uh, uh, opportunities to ensuring that we have rainwater tanks, recycle water. I'm sitting next to Frank, he's in the housing business, he tells me. Um, I hope he's good at it. 
Um, but you know, the whole layer of, uh, of regulations that we've introduced to make sure that you're environmentally friendly, um, and some of them will be very good, I'm sure. Uh, what's important, though, uh, is that if we're going to help people to be responsible, whether it's with or without legislation and regulatory uh, imposition, uh, then we've got to make sure that the impact on the environment actually has a remedy uh, and that we're actually addressing the, the right issue rather than uh, the impact um, on a fishing industry, recreational 300,000, all your friends and your neighbours who go off and catch mud crabs or fish or whatever, uh, these are all uh, important contributions to the community. And I won't go into today, but suffice to say uh, that the uh, less than 4% area that the government have drawn up as being inalienable for the purpose of fishing has meant that you and I as taxpayers are going to pay a significant amount of money to buy back quotas of crayfish and scale fishing in the commercial sector. It is a big financial impact, impost uh, when we draw up, uh, when we, have, we come to solutions which seem like a good idea at the time, uh, but of which uh, don't address the problem. Uh, recently I asked uh, a, a number of questions about what was going to be done for the enforcement uh, to ensure that people actually do uh, comply with these uh, obligations. Uh, and uh, I was told that the government are currently working on a phone app. So for those of you who are fishing people or have friends, let them know that you'll soon be able to have an app uh, which can tell you whether you're apparently going to be in the zone or not and whether, of course, you're in, uh, in an off-limit area. This would be good, of course, because I don't know about most of you, but I actually go fishing to get away from my phone. I don't actually want to take it out in the dinghy at the time. But nevertheless, that's the, uh, that's the surveillance solution in addition to asking some of the fishing inspectors to just keep an eye out for those who might be in the wrong spot. I'm not sure who's going to tell the fish about where the boundaries are. You can see them swimming along and think, oops, oh, we better not go over there, I might get caught, or I better stay in this zone. And of course, the 50 people that might have gone into a fish in an area that, uh, are, of course, is now to be excluded, they'll be over filling up the space in the area next door, blocking up the boat ramp and all the other things that need to be uh, addressed. So, uh, look, I I'm very disturbed by uh, what has been a 10-year exercise and uh, what we get out of it is uh, an inadequate solution to some very serious problems, uh, not fishing management, uh, but serious uh, problems of pollution uh, and disturbance to our, our coastal and uh, marine environment. Uh, diddly squat being allocated to actually deal with it. Uh, the promise of an app for your phone. Uh, and I think, inevitably, uh, a new scale of uh, fees that will apply. And I, the reason I tell you is this. If you go in and take a photograph at Belair National Park and you sell that photograph, uh, you have to pay a fee for the purposes of being a professional photographer uh, for the purposes of uh, taking a photograph, even though it's a, it's a public park. Now, I don't have a big problem with that, uh, except that I pointed out to them of the thousands of people that come to South Australia, whether they're from interstate or Japan or overseas or whatever, they, of course, can come in take photographs, pay no permit fee, go back to Japan uh, and sit there in Ginza and download it and sell it to the world. I don't have to pay a fee. But our people have to pay a fee now to go into all parks. And if there's new, new parks going to be established, then it will come. And the reason why I know I'm right is because when the government decided that they're going to do a, uh, a one for the um, encounter region, which is the sort of Victor Harbour across uh, to um, uh, Kangaroo Island, and I asked them, how many inspectors are you going to have? And they said, well, look, we haven't really decided yet. We might have one or two. And, and how is this going to be paid? We said, well, we actually proposed to do a fee uh, for anyone who might actually go into this area, photograph on seabirds or underwater. And we're also going to have a fee for uh, planes that traverse water. I thought, really? So I kept that material. Uh, and it's, it'll be there for when it uh, comes out. Now, I might sound negative on this. I don't want to be negative about this. This is a really important issue, and it concerns me. Uh, but uh, I just think that if any of you uh, have an interest, uh, as I do, in protecting our marine environment, you'll demand of whoever uh, is in the leadership roles uh, who are advising on these matters to ensure that they do something that's effective and not unfairly damaging to the very communities uh, uh, 
who uh, of course rely on uh, coastal and holiday living in a lifestyle of which we enjoy. Now I've got lots of fishing stories, I'm not going to bore you with them today, uh, but I uh, just want to say that um, uh, this is an important uh, area of policy, it's one of which we have made a commitment on our side of politics to as we go to the election, uh, but it will be the issue. And this, only this morning I had an email from a lady who, who runs a bait shop in Port Wakefield uh, and she says, look, I want you to just keep going, Vicky, because this is really hurting us. And uh, we, we have ups and downs when primary produce is good in South Australia, uh, but our, our community and towns very heavily rely on uh, the tourism and benefits and opportunities that we all enjoy when we go out of an urban environment uh, and of which they so heavily rely on for their livelihood. And I'm happy to talk otherwise about Julia Gillard or anyone else. Thank you very much. <laughs> I think Vicky has, before I close, I have two questions, perhaps start with Peter, Peter then. I'll come back to you, Albert, next. Thank you. Vicky. I know this is going to be difficult. Well, no, the two of these. <laughs> Thanks, Vicky, for an interesting talk. As a member of a boating family, I was particularly interested in your comment about the fish going to kill the fish. Yes. Particularly as the rules now say that something like you can't pass water uh, without to, within two more than miles of the coastline. Do the fish care and do they know? So I, so I, I move on. I don't want to talk about fishing. I want to ask your particular expertise and experience and the question about the referendum that's slated for the election, whenever it is called, about uh, funding of local government. I know this is a subject that, uh, that you're close to you. It just seems rather odd to be uh, now legitimising something that has been happening in the way of cost shifting for too long. And I'm not too sure whether we, uh, as a community, will be serviced by the Feds funding councils directly and bypassing our state legislature. Now, look, in short, uh, our position on that is that we don't support uh, a yes vote. So uh, we would be um, saying we supported the federal parliament uh, passing legislation to allow, allow a referendum. I think there should be a choice on these things. Um, can I just wear a legal hat for a moment? Many years before I went to the Parliament, I uh, sat on the Constitutional Board to review what we do with the South Australian Constitution in the event that uh, we became a federal republic. And I'm an, I was an advocate of becoming a federal republic. And um, uh, the, uh, this question of uh, recognition um, of um, local government was canvassed uh, in that. Um, and so I wasn't in the state parliament, there was no you know, particular um, preference for any level of government. Um, and we considered at a constitutional and legal level that that wasn't the smart thing to do. Now, there, look, there are a number of reasons for that. Can I just say that um, we are, along with the United States, the least governed country in the world. Now people get surprised at that. Uh, but if you go to Germany, for example, there are seven levels of government. And uh, so we, we keep getting this mantra about how we're over-governed because we have three levels of government. Well, in fact, nothing could be further from the truth. But uh, can I say that this direct sort of funding idea was a way of, uh, and, and for those who aren't aware, a federal parliament exists because the state colonies pass legislation to refer certain areas of responsibility, you know, defence, wars and so on, to, to the federal arena. Uh, and, and also ex local government exists, again, from state governments uh, parliaments passing legislation to give them autonomy in certain areas and they have planning responsibility and the like. And, and, and look, there's some overlap in some of those things. Uh, what's happening now is that the share of the cake, the GST of course comes through to the states, it's collected by the feds because they happen to have a taxation office which is uh, virulent, it grows every day I think. Mean. But they, um, uh, and they also carve up the money that's allocated for income tax because we have agreed not to take income tax. So this fiscal sort of responsibility, although federal parliaments will say, well, we're giving you state's money, the reality is they're just giving up back the share uh, under agreement. So there's not... Um, the, the expectation from the uh, local government people who say to me, look, oh, we want to support a yes vote, Vicky, because, you know, we, we want to have recognition, we want to have security of money. Well, there's nothing further from the truth. But the, the, the recognition that there's a capacity to transfer money, which is what they've been doing for over 100 years anyway, um, is, 
uh, it, 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 nothing in the constitutional recognition that actually gets anything. It's, it's, so it's, uh, um, the, the issue arose because it was a High Court decision, <coughs> if I could be really quick on it, just to, to say that uh, for providing for counsellors uh, in schools, direct funding was challenged, the validity of that. And um, if you think you have difficulty challenging a department in South Australia, uh, why do you have to go to Canberra every time to challenge if there's an issue on that? So look, there are a number of issues. Uh, it concerns me greatly. It's a bit of a red herring, I think, as a, as a decoy to one of the more important issues of the federal election. But, you know, successive governments are good at that. They throw up something that they think will attract the attention of people. I, I think the LGA has been sucked in, and I've told them so. Um, Albert, is it a quick one? Mine is a yes or no question. Yes. Um, do I buy your jewellery? <laughs> Government gets that $700 impost on car parking. I believe you will repeal it. Yes. Yes, yes or no? Yes. Yes. And the other one is I think you only take a million when you said you don't have any foot and mouth in this. <laughs> 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 uh, I think we've been very privileged today to hear an individual who speaks clearly to the point. Uh, it is unusual in my experience in the political world to find someone like that. And uh, Vicky has been able to crystallise ideas and bring reality into a very practical level, which I think more and more of our politicians should look at, because that's where the, the population sees the integrity of the politician. Please thank Vicky while I provide her with a nicely coloured napkin. <laughs>